we return to the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I was thinking yesterday that you know, whenever I come to a text to, to dig into it and to, to seek to understand a deeper sense or a deep, deeper meaning, I, I feel like I'm a kid in a sandbox. <laughs> you know, I, I just, uh, or a kid in a toy store. It's just, it's just, I'm just excited to, to dig into the text and to, uh, to draw from it things that I maybe haven't seen before. And uh, looking down the road, uh, Lord willing, next week, I think, it's uh, looking at the sign of Jonah. And, and then uh, a few weeks later, probably, uh, the, um, the parable of the sower. So this in Matthew 13, there's a, there's a great deal of parables there, kingdom parables. And so I'm looking forward to getting into that. Uh, the, the parable of the sower is indeed, um, I think, my favorite, my favorite parable. And it's really... Uh, it's really, really a good parable, very important. <clears throat> Therefore, this morning, I want to look <clears throat> at Matthew 12, 33 to 37, and the title is, A Tree is Known by Its Fruit. A Tree is Known by Its Fruit. I want to read verse 33 to 37. Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure bring, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, for by your words will be justified, and by your words will be condemned. Let's pray. O Lord our God, we come before you, we thank you for the words of Christ. Christ's words are indeed so profound. And Lord, I come to you, and Lord, all so, too often, Lord, I come before you with, with humility and with wonder. Who am I, Lord, to try to explain the words of Christ? But Lord, I pray that you would use me. And Lord, I trust that I have been faithful in understanding the meaning, the sense of what Christ is saying. So Lord, I pray that you bless our time, that your spirit may be our teacher, that you would indeed help us understand the sense of these wonderful words of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As I was preparing this uh, sermon, I was thinking of a few quotes, one of them is in the scriptures, in, in Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinks, for as a man thinks, so is he. And I also I came across a quote from Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor, and he said the following, he was also a Stoic philosopher, and he says, we become what we think about. And we see that uh, our passage uh, this morning raises many important issues. It affirms that every human being has a heart. And uh, in that, I'm not talking about the blood pump <laughs> in your body, in your chest, but the, that part of man, the, the, the spirit, the, it, the heart is part of, part of the spirit of every human being. And so it's that invisible part, it is a spiritual part of man. So all of us, we all have a heart. But it also affirms that what comes out of our mouths is a reflection of what is in our hearts. What comes out of our mouths is a reflection or reflects what is in our heart, which is why Christ says in Matthew 12, verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is in our hearts this morning? What is in our hearts? What are those words that come out of our mouths? This raises the question, how can someone know us better in an intimate way? How can someone come to know us intimately? <coughs> Is it by the way how we dress? Is it by the way how we walk? Is it the way we work? Is it the way we eat? Well, in fact, it's through our speech. The people will come to know our hearts through our speech, through our words. And in knowing what is in our hearts 
they will come to know our true selves. <clears throat> and I thought about this. Of course, this is the reason why our God chose to reveal himself to us. Did God not choose to reveal himself through words, through his only word? It's true that we see that there is a God through creation, uh, Romans 1 and, and, and Psalm 19, uh, and that we know that God created everything. We know that there is a God. There is a, a divine being. There is a creator, a creator, a powerful being who made all these things. And um, But it is through his word, the Bible, that we come to know the heart and the mind of God. It's through his word we come to know the heart and the mind of God. And we'll return to this uh, at, toward the end of the message. So turning to our text this morning, I believe firmly that our passage, verse 33 to 37, is a continuation of our Lord's thought processes from the confrontation that he had with the Pharisees. In that context, the Pharisees had started to accuse Jesus of being Beelzebub. In chapter 9, we see that's maybe the first, uh, in, uh, first occasion, first instance, where they were talking about uh, Jesus being Beelzebub. In also chapter 10, Christ makes reference to that. And, uh, and so here in Matthew 12, they came right out and uh, in a full and a final judge, jury, and executioner statement and condemnation against Jesus. And they says, uh, we see in verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. And so when they made that statement, they, they condemned themselves. So we see in this context regarding the matter of the uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that we see that after seeing the full power, these Pharisees, after seeing the full power of the Holy Spirit on display through the person of Christ, the Son of God, they concluded in their hardened hearts, keep that in mind, uh, they concluded in their hardened hearts against Jesus that he was performing these miracles by the powers of darkness, the devil himself. This was black magic. This a very serious statement on their part. And because of the uniqueness and the unrepeatable circumstances, circumstances, circumstances rather, <laughs> surrounding Christ's incarnation, and we know that's not repeatable, from this angle alone, one can conclude that the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, can be committed by unbelievers only during the days of Christ's incarnation, because it was a specific context. Now, I, I am open to the further study to discover, well, well after Christ, Christ's ascension to heaven, is it possible that some people may be guilty of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Well, I think that's possible. That's a definite maybe. <laughs> um, so we see from this, from that context, that no true believer can ever commit that sin. Be comforted. No true believer can ever commit that sin. It is a topic of further discussion, and, uh, and study to determine if, if unbelievers after Christ's ascension can commit this sin. Again, that's something for later on. Thus, from this context, we see that these men spoke blasphemies that came from their hearts, which is what our Lord is making reference to in our passage. And their words revealed something extremely profound regarding the state of their hearts Namely, that they were evil. Christ makes that definite statement. That is, they were in an unconverted spiritual state. So there's four points I want to bring out this morning from this passage. Number one, very simple, very basic. Number one, the fruit of the tree always reveals to us the kind of tree it is and how healthy it is. Verse 33, Jesus says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. And I love the way that our Lord teaches. Very simple uh, illustrations and yet so profound. And uh, so let's break it down. Jesus says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good. So on the one hand, you'll see this. You'll see a, a tree that is good, healthy, and then you'll see with that, 
good fruit. In this illustration, sometimes uh, maybe a little parable, Christ is stating the obvious uh, regarding trees and their fruit. Uh, if, if the tree is healthy, then you will have healthy, good fruit. So the meaning of the image is evident. If one sees good fruit, one will say that the tree is good or vice versa. For only on the basis of the fruit can one recognize the value of a tree. How do you know that a tree is healthy? Well, I remember growing up, uh, we were living in Middle Lake, and then we, uh, one time we had a weekend uh, camping event with family in uh, Monetteville. And um, there was an, old, it was an old farm property, and there was an old house, and uh, around the house there were a couple of apple trees. And of course, you know, apples, apples only grow that well up here. Anyway, so I no noticed that the tree, the, the, were, the leaves were not, you know, there weren't that many leaves on a tree, and there were apples, and the apples were not healthy. And so I could basically, even at the age of uh, seven or eight years old, I could tell that this is not a healthy tree. Something wrong with this tree. And so we see very evidently that when you see bad fruit, then we know that the tree is not healthy. And so Christ continues in that verse. He says, or make the tree bad, and its fruit bad. So the opposite is also true. If the tree is bad or unhealthy, then the fruit will also be bad. Very clear, very evident, and even a little child can figure that out. And the conclusion of the matter, Jesus says, and uh, for the tree is known by its fruit. Therefore, in the natural world, we are all aware of plants and trees uh, uh, with all the various fruits that they produce. So is our Lord teaching us here a lesson on tree farming? Well, obviously not, because in the next verse we see what he's, what he's, what he's referring to. Well, uh, this uh, verse and this section uh, also parallels Christ's words that are found in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, I don't have it on screen. Matthew 7, 17 to 20, and we'll return to this text later on. Uh, Jesus says the following, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a, a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So we'll return to this passage a bit later on. So we see in this verse very basic uh, information. But then he goes into the next verse uh, and he explains what he's saying in his spiritual sense. So my next point, number two, is the words that come out of people's mouths always reveal the kind of heart that they have and reveal its spiritual health. The words that come out of people's mouths always reveal the kind of heart that they have and also reveal the spiritual health of that person. And that's a scary thought. The words that come out of our mouths say a lot about us. And say everything about us. So verse 34, Jesus says, <clears throat> You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I think a very important question here is, is whom is he addressing here in these, in these words? Who is he talking to? That's an important question. Well, looking at the immediate context, it seems clear that he's addressing the Pharisees who had just committed the unpardonable sin, where they uttered some terrible words and blasphemies against the Holy Spirit. And interesting, interestingly, John the Baptist also spoke similar words, the same words, regarding the Pharisees when he confronted them in Matthew 3, verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> Look at what it says. It says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers. Same words. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He's saying, he's basically uh, kind of mocking them, like, you guys are really repenting? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He says, furthermore, in verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Show the evidence. Where's the evidence? Where's the fruit? So we can uh, understand the words root of vipers, basically saying, you offspring. You generation of venomous snakes. In French, race de vital. What's a lot of that? And so the important question to them 
is how is it possible for you to speak anything good since you are evil? How is that possible? It's a rhetorical question. It's not possible. So this was a completely accurate assessment and, and charge against them. For these were the men who spoke the most blasphemous words against the Holy Spirit. Works that the Holy Spirit performed. God Almighty performed these words. And they said, this is the work of the devil. As this, these works were done through the hand of Christ, the Son of God. Basically, you can't escape after making such a statement. After expressing with your mouth that you believe firmly in your heart. You can't escape. You, you can't. You can't escape from this. You have just exposed just how evil you really are, even though you are fanatically religious. Which is why Jesus says in verse 34, you brutal vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? It's again, it's a rhetorical question. You can't speak good because you're evil at the root. Thus, in the illustration of the tree and its fruit, a good tree will bear good fruit, and a bad tree will bear bad fruit. If you are in an unconverted state, in time, what is in your heart will become firmly established, usually in your adult life, by the words that come out of your mouth. Let me say this again. If a person is in an unconverted state, in time, what is in your heart will become Firmly established, usually in your adult life, by the words that come out of your mouth. And we know this for a fact. We know many people who are in their, in their adult lives and are firmly entrenched against the things of God, don't want to hear the gospel, and they're, they, are, they are very foul with their mouths, and they are resistant to the call of the gospel. And so what we see is what's in their hearts also comes out of their mouths, foul language. Going back to Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart, he says, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. He says, all these things for all these evil things come from within, and they defile the person. Going back to our text, verse 34, Matthew 12, Jesus says, You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is a rather catchy phrase, a catchy statement, because I remember when I was a young Christian reading this for the first time, it just stuck, it stuck in my head. I remembered it. And we know it's true. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <clears throat> Uh, it's full of truth as a summary of what we have seen so far. So Jesus says here, for out of the abundance, which basically means out of the surplus, out of the overabundance uh, of the, uh, what is left over, over and above, of, from the heart, the mouth speaks. Very interesting. Uh, and I did a bit of search on the internet, and I typed Ligonier uh, regarding this matter, and I found here a cat catechism of the heart I'm going to share with you what it says, a very, a very concise statement. What is the heart? What is the heart, the human heart? Where the Ligonier definition is, the heart is the central core and drive of my life intellectually. It involves my mind. Affectionately, affectionately it shapes my soul. And totally, it provides the energy for my living. Thus, what is at the center of our hearts drives our minds, drives our lives, drives our bodies affectionately. It becomes our passion. And ultimately, what is in our hearts will come out of our mouths, revealing exactly who we are for the world to see. How do we get to know someone? Not what they say, primarily. And so, a catechism of the heart Continues and says, is my heart healthy? Well, the definition here, of course, is no. By nature, I have a diseased heart from birth. My heart is deformed and antagonistic to God. The intentions of its thoughts are evil continually. 
The heart is the center of human personality. It is the mouth that reveals what's in the heart. How then can those who are evil say anything good? What is needed is a change of heart. So point number three. The words of people will reveal whether they are a good person or an evil person. This basically uh, is a continuation of the second point. But Christ uses this terminology, a good person or an evil person. Look at the verse, in verse 35. It says here, the good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. These are profound words. So here's the dilemma. Who are those who are good persons, and who are those who are evil persons? So the question is, who determines these things? Who determines these things? Well, there's an illusion, a self-deception, that is innate, which means inborn or natural with all human beings. And that illusion is that we're born good, that we're all good. But on occasion, I may do a few slip-ups here and there, but we're all good. We're all good. And that's a, an illusion that essentially all of us are born with. There's a doctrine known as pervasive depravity that I believe, and uh, sometimes we hear it as total depravity. The reason why I prefer pervasive depravity is because total depravity it gives the idea that all of us we're all uh, as evil as we could be, and we're basically equal to the devil himself. Well, that, that's not true. Right? We're not totally uh, depraved. We're not totally sinful uh, like, like the devil. Um, by the fall, so pervasive depravity basically uh, is a, a better definition, in my opinion. It says, by the fall of Adam and Eve, all aspects of man have been affected. The heart, the mind, the will, the emotions, the intellect. Every part of us has been affected. And so it's tainted by sin, which is why we will see a certain measure of goodness on a human level, which we can attribute to common grace. Which is why some of the evil despots in the past and maybe in the present, we see them able to love their children, and provide for their children, and care for their children, and give presents for their children at their, on their birthday, and so forth. So, it, 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 but it explains that even our goodness is also tainted. Well, here, in this context, our Lord is directly attacking his opponents, that is, who are evil. And this is something where, you know, they can't help themselves because it's in their nature. Because from their treasury, they cannot bring forth any, anything else but evil. Uh, I don't know if any, if any of you have ever heard the story of the scorpion and the frog. I heard this many, many years ago. And, uh, and I found it online. And basically, there could be variations of the story. The story goes like this. A, a scorpion came to the uh, edge of a river and uh, needed to cross over to the other side. And saw a frog and asked the frog, hey, can, you, can I go on your back? And, I'll, and, you, and you can bring me over to the other side. And the frog says, well, no way, because you're going to sting me. And, and, says, and the scorpion says, well, listen, if I sting you, then you die and I die. We'll both, we both drown. And the frog said, okay. So as they were crossing over halfway, the scorpion stung him. And, then the, and the frog says, why did you do that? He says, I can't help it. It's my, it's my nature. Huh. So regarding human nature, you know what? We can't help it. It's our nature. Um, so here's the dilemma. Who are those good persons in this uh, verse? And who are those who are evil persons in Christ's, in Christ's illustration? Who determines this? Well, obviously God is the one who determines this. Verse 35, let's look at, look at the verse. It says here, the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. For what the Lord has entered into our lives at the moment of our rebirth, there is an instant transformation. We are a new creation. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and he must come. So there's an instant transformation. There's a rebirth. We receive the Spirit of God. We're baptized into the body of Christ. 
uh, wonderful things. But then there's also the ongoing transformation of changing us, changing you into the likeness of Christ. That ongoing transformation which is our sanctification. Thus, for the believer, his treasury continues to grow with good things as he grows in grace, as he grows in Christ. Which means that good words inevitably will come out. Right? So as we are going through that process of ongoing transformation, uh, good words and works will become more and more evident. Look at verse 34. Jesus says, or out of the abundance of a heart, the mouth speaks. Or out of the treasury, our treasury. This is both for believers and unbelievers. that Christ is referring to here. Uh, a verse that came to mind to explain the treasury is regarding the heart. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, so the, the treasure is basically what's in our hearts. So we see that the opposite is also true, that uh, while we are born sinners and evil, the longer a person remains outside of Christ's saving grace, their treasury remains a growing source of evil deeds and evil words. Let me say that again. The longer a person remains outside of Christ, outside of Christ's saving grace, their treasury remains a growing source of evil deeds and words. So as a summary of this point from verse 35, our Lord uses the terms good person and evil person to describe the ones who are converted and those who are unconverted. While the believer will move forward from glory to glory, accumulating treasures in his treasury, it will become evident in his speech. So as we look at our speech as Christians, um, is it becoming more and more evident when we are Christians to the people around us in our speech? For, but for unbelievers, while they remain in their unconverted state, their treasury is not filled with good things from God. And that will become increasingly evident also by their speech, even to believers. We will see that the speech of unbelievers just gets goes from bad to worse. Going back to the passage in Matthew 7, verse 15, Christ was speaking about the Pharisees, the scribes, and, and Sadducees, and so forth. He says the following, Beware of false prophets, those who make who claim to proclaim or preach the word of God, beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered by thorn from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits, by their speech, by their words. So final point is our God will justify us before God. And our words will condemn us, or our words will condemn us on the day of judgment. And this is a topic where I can spend a great deal more time on, but uh, for the sake of time, of course, it will be shortened. So, point number four our words will justify us before God, or our words will condemn us on the day of judgment. So, going to verse 36 and 37, Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless or idle word they speak. By, for by your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. We know that true faith, true faith in Christ, is inseparable from good words and good works. You can't separate them. But the opposite is true. Not having faith in Christ will become evident in ongoing evil words and works. And our Lord is the accountant in heaven with a perfect memory. Right? He remembers everything. For he remembers everything anyone has ever spoken from the time of Adam and Eve until the second coming of Christ. Going back to verse 36, Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give, will give an account for every careless or idle 
word they speak. Every insignificant word or every significant word, the Lord remembers everything that we say. He remembers. Again, that's a scary thought. <laughs> it's a good reminder for us. So um, <clears throat> let's not think that God will have amnesia on Judgment Day. He's not going to forget. But he also remembers every evil word and every good word, which is why uh, I thought of this one passage, um, which is why I think it's important for us to keep our words few. You know, there, you, sometimes you meet people that are very good, you know, gifted in speaking, and they just on, on, going on and on and on. And sometimes if you talk more, you end up uh, tripping on your own words, right? So uh, you need to be careful. So it says here in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2, do not be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. So I think it's a good thing for us to be reminded that uh, when we pray, of course, this is a reference to prayer, but also in, in, regarding our, our regular lives, you know, we need to, to be careful what we say and, and how we say things. Um, and um, I remember hearing a quote years ago, uh, it was like something like this. Lord, O oh Lord, um, may my words always be gracious and kind, because one day I may have to eat them. <laughs> so these are words uh, that we need to uh, remind ourselves. And because evil thoughts and deeds and words are essentially inseparable from each other, our words have a way of validating sin which began in the heart, right? So whenever we say something, when, when someone, uh, speak of a uh, non-Christian, uh, that will just say with his mouth, and it's because it was already in his heart. And the same is true for us. If we sin with our mouths, it's because it was already in our hearts. And it is true that from the overflow of, the, of an evil heart, it is inevitable that the mouth will speak forth evil words. It's inevitable. Which is why our, why our words will justify or condemn us. All of our words spoken will be used for or against us. When I wrote this down, I thought, you know, when a person is arrested, what will the police say? They'll say something like this. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And so, the same is true for all of us, all as human beings. Whatever we say, we'll be held, uh, we'll have to give an account before God, whether we're believers or not believers. So, to bring this to a close here this morning, the basic gospel is this. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in the person of Christ alone. And upon conversion, upon rebirth, the person is justified in the sight of God. It is a declaration where God says, I declare you to be righteous, just in my sight. It's irrevocable. The judge will never go back on his statement. And that's what God does. When he saves us, he makes an official declaration. He takes his gavel and hits the block. He says, you are declared righteous in my sight for eternity. And conversion brings about an inward transformation where even our speech has changed and th although not yet perfected. We know that. How many of us can agree with that? <laughs> Our speech is not yet perfected. My simple point is this, that as Christians, what brings us to heaven is not our good works or our good words, but faith in Christ. And so this verse may, give, may seem to uh, give the impression that, oh, if I just do say good words, I'll get to heaven. No, this is not what Christ is saying. Even though all Christians will speak idle words here and there. Which is why I look at this verse in this way. Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing, By your words it will be revealed that you are my sons and daughters. By your words it will be revealed that you are already my sons and daughters. Here's a quote from William Hendrickson. He says, Nevertheless, his works, and this includes his words, supply the needed evidence showing whether or not he was and is a child of God. So your words as Christians will reveal that you are indeed a child of God. Your words will not bring you to heaven. Your good words will not bring you to heaven, but it is simply by faith in Christ. That's, that's what's going to bring you to heaven. But also, we're looking at this on the positive side for Christians. The opposite is also true. All 
the works and the words of unbelievers supply the needed evidence that they were never a child of God to begin with, and they will stand condemned. What do our words reveal about us? What do our words reveal about us? Concluding thoughts. <clears throat> we will all come to know each other, what's in our hearts, through our words and through our speech. It's through conversation, through fellowship and dialogue. Even so, we will come to know the one through God, through His words. Him speaking to us through the Holy Scriptures. Do you want to come to know the heart and mind of God? God's revealing it. Read His Word. God is revealing His heart in His Word. It is Him revealing Himself to humanity, where He reveals again His heart. The Bible is His love letter to fallen mankind. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But it's astonishing to me, as I look at myself, a mere wretched sinner, that God in His heart has a genuine desire for us, for me, to come to know Him intimately. That's His desire, that we come to know Him in an intimate way, and that's the burden of His heart. Now, today's passage is indeed a difficult one to read and to hear and to preach. Uh, let, me, let me admit, I'll, I'll be frank, it's very, it was difficult for me to say a lot of the things I said this morning, but I have to be truthful to the text. It is difficult to, to say that there are those who will not make it to heaven, and that when a person is living uh, in this world with a, uh, with a, with a foul mouth, it's an indication that they are not believers, and uh, they had evil deeds, they had evil words, on the day of judgment, God will condemn them if they don't come to Christ. These are difficult things for me to say. And our Lord presents to us the reality that not everyone is righteous in His sight. And that not everyone will be received by Him on judgment day. Words are indeed powerful. Because our God created everything in six literal days by the power of spoken word. And all careless, idle, and intentional words spoken will be brought to our attention by the God who does not forget. He'll say to us, do you remember you said this? Do you remember you said that? And we'll say, ah, I forgot. Because God says, you, you did say that. You did say this. It's a, re it's a revelation that <laughs> you're not a believer. If we're in Christ, our words will justify us and will reveal that we, that we're indeed one of his blood-bought children. But for those who are not in Christ, their words will reveal that they were never part of the family of God, but they were sons of the devil. So the basic appeal is this. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come to Christ, come as you are, come in your filthiness, because we're all filthy, and you will receive God's free offer of grace and eternal life. I can't give that to you. Only God can give that to you. Only Christ can give that to you. And you will be on the path of ongoing heart transformation and ongoing speech transformation. God's still working on me, on my speech transformation. The same is true for all of us. So when you come to Christ, God will change your heart. He will change your speech. It will change your deeds to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord help us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I confess that the things that I have read, the things that I preached on, were difficult for me to preach. It is the truth. Lord, we pray that you would move us as believers to... From, uh, from glory to glory, and help us, Lord, to, um, to sanctify our speech, Lord, that we would become more like Christ, not only in our hearts, but also in words, but also in deeds. And Lord, we pray and, and we plead for those who are outside of the family of God at this point in time. We think of our family members, we think, Lord, of friends and neighbors, and Lord, where we see the evidence that they are not in Christ because of their speech and how they... They speak blasphemies against you. We pray, Father, for that. 
We pray that they would come to the saving knowledge of Christ, even today. So Lord, bless each one. Help us, Lord, to move on to from glory to glory, to spend time in your word, to, to read your word, Lord, and, and to know your heart and your mind so that we will be transformed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.